Well, good morning, Rejoice Church. Good morning. Uh, welcome. My name is Ryan Golightly. Thanks for being with us. As Casey said, this is our last week of That's Not Fair. How many of you have ever heard a child say that? Or you've said it in your own, own heart? Now listen, we did this in the first service, and they did it with meaning and purpose behind it, okay? So since this is our last week, we're all going to say that together like we mean it, okay? Let the inner child in you just rise up and just shout it out this morning, okay? Can you do that with me on the count of three? Ready? One, two, three. That's not fair. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Doesn't that feel good? All right, one more time. Ready? Ready? One, two, three. That's not fair. That's not fair, right? I mean, living in a pandemic, it's just really not fair, right? Can I get an amen on that? Anybody? Yeah? It's just not fair. It's not normal. There's nothing, you, there's nothing pleasant about it, right? You just sour grapes. No, I'm just kidding, okay? But there are a lot of things in life where we, we cry out, that's not fair. I mean, if you've had uh, children, obviously you've heard that phrase before. If you've ever been around a child, you don't even have to have children. Uh, just be around uh, co-workers, right, neighbors. There's a sentiment that that's not fair. And this is our last week in the Gospel of Matthew, which uh, if you have your Bibles today, you can go ahead and start heading that way. So look at this topic of fairness, uh, because uh, right now, it feels like we're living in a world where we're flying upside down, okay? Right now, this is what life feels like. We, uh, everything's been flipped upside down, and all we see is the ground, and uh, we're going against human nature because we want, we want equilibrium, right? We want balance. We, we want things to be set right, so everything inside of us in the middle of a pandemic cries out, that's not fair. Life is not going the way we want it to, but honestly, since when has it ever really completely always gone our way, all right? Do uh, you remember as a kid, if you had a sibling, maybe they got something that you didn't have, you would immediately say, that's not fair, right? That, I want what they have. Why didn't I get one of those, you know? And uh, well, it happens as adults. You can see an adult another couple, another family, a, a neighbor, someone you work with, all of a sudden they have a new car or they have a new house. And the, in the day and age of social media, you get to see everybody's highlights, right? They have a new career or they have a marriage that you'd like to have or they would, you would like to be able to parent the way they parent or their kids behave and it doesn't feel like your kids ever behave. And all of a sudden you see something that you don't have and you go, I want that, that's not <laughs> fair. And there's something inside of us that battles against that. That we want what is fair to us. We see other people have, as the haves, and we're the have-nots. And in our uh, flesh, whether we are living in a pandemic or not, okay, no matter what, we're always in this world flying upside down without God. And the purpose of Jesus all throughout the Gospel of Matthew, as we've been looking over the past few weeks, is to flip things right side up, to help us fly through life correctly and properly. And so many times through these parables, as Casey's been walking us through the past few weeks, Jesus takes the way we see the world and the goggles that we look through are often the false way to look at things. And he's trying to flip things over so that we can see things the way God sees them. And that's why in today's uh, message, it's starting with the kingdom of God is like this. This is the kingdom gospel. Matthew is the kingdom gospel. It's constantly talking about Jesus as king. And so many times over and over and over, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. And one after another, as we've been seeing in Matthew 18, 19, and 20, Jesus is addressing things that in our hearts and in our flesh, we automatically battle with saying, that's not fair. That's not the way it's supposed to be, right? But Jesus, in his grace and in his kindness, he's going to uh, once again address the issue of fairness that rises up in our hearts. When Jesus says the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like, like he's going to do today, what he's trying to do is to help you and I focus on what is really real in this world. And what is real is God, God himself. He's ultimate reality. And God has a kingdom. The king has a kingdom. And there's a way 
to live in that kingdom. Now, God's kingdom is where God rules and where God reigns. But the truth of the matter is today, you have a kingdom as well, or a queendom, if you will, okay? You have a kingdom or a queendom. Your kingdom is where you get to do whatever you say, right? It's anything you have say over in this world where you rule and you, and you reign, that's your kingdom. But the point of Jesus speaking into our hearts about the kingdom of God is that the throne of your heart is the issue. That no longer you and I would place ourselves on the throne of our hearts, but that we would let the king of kings and the ruler of all to rule even in our own hearts and our lives. So that instead of the cry of our heart when we see things as not really being fair in this world, instead of shouting out, that's not fair, instead it would be, God, may your kingdom come and your will be done in my own heart and in my own life today. And so that's our, that's our cry as Christ followers, as Jesus' disciples, and that's what we're going to be jumping into today in Matthew chapter 20. Now, if you have Matthew chapter 20, would you say, I've got it? Okay. Jesus is teaching in Matthew and in today's sermon uh, about fairness. Now, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 through 16, there's, there's an issue that's going to pop up. And the question becomes, which one do you really want? Do you want fairness or do you want grace? Do you want fairness today or do you want grace today? And every single day. Because as one pastor put it, uh, you can, we can look at everyone else in the world and try to measure ourselves up against them and, and how, how their life is going and how our life is going and start to compare and contrast. And you can see, well, that's not fair and that's not fair. And that begins to create some jealousy and some envy and some kind of evil thoughts that rise up in your own heart. Or you can look through, as one pastor calls them, the gospel goggles of grace. It's a lot of G words, right? <laughs> the gospel goggles. That you see things the way God sees them. That everything is grace. All is grace from God. So if you're there, Matthew chapter 20, I'm going to start reading. This is the parable about the workers in the vineyard. Now, as I read, I'm going to give you a cheat sheet, okay? This is the cheat sheet for the story. In the story, there will be a vineyard. That's the world. The vineyard that we're going to read about, it's the world at large. There's a landowner, and that's God in the parable, and the workers in the parable are us. Okay, are you ready? Ready, set, here we go. I'm reading from the NIV. Jesus says, for the kingdom of heaven is like. Now I have to pause right there. You're like, oh, great, here we go. One of those things where a pastor reads like two words and then stops. All right, now here's the thing. This is coming right off the tail Duh, of Matthew chapter 19. Thank you, thank you. I'll be here all day. No? All right. A lot of uh, people much smarter than myself, okay, scholars, wise men from ages old, all right, they say there shouldn't even really be a break between chapter 19 and chapter 20. That what Casey preached about last week, about the rich young ruler, and how chapter 19 ended, for the first will be last, and many who are last will be first, we're, we're just going right into the next parable, which is why he says, for the kingdom of heaven is like. So this is all one big conversation. So if you want, you can go back, listen to last week's message, read that passage, and then read today's passage for a little deeper study. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning, that's about 6 a.m., to hire workers for his vineyard. He, agree, he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon, and he did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Verse 7, because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. So the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came 
and each received a denarius. That's a day's wage. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. Well, duh, they got there at 6 a.m., right? But each one of them also received a denarius. <gasps> bum, bum, bum. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day? But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. That's the word of the Lord, amen? That's Jesus' teaching. Now, this is a difficult parable to hear today. I'm just going to be honest, okay? This is difficult teaching, especially when you're speaking to maybe a lot of Christians in the room. And you're like, wait a minute, but Christians listening to the Bible, that should be, a... just hold on, all right? The thing about the day here, uh, this is the fun part. It's, this is self-explanatory, all right? Work shift. Man, in America, do we understand work shifts, right? You work from this time to this time. You get your time off. You go. You earn your pay, right? You work hard, and at the end of the day or the week or the month, you get a paycheck, and all that other stuff gets taken out of it, and you go home with what you have, right? Well, on the work day uh, there in Palin, it went in three-hour shifts, 6 a.m., 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., and the end of the day is 6 p.m. So when the landowner goes out, when God goes out to call people to himself, there's only an hour left in the work day. Now, this is a very typical uh, scenario. Uh, it, there's actually a fall break in Scotland. Now, I'm, I'm excited because I see a lot of students in here, okay? You want to know what the old fall break was in Scotland? In mid-autumn, there would be what's called potato lifting. And where all the potato farmers would desperately need help, so all of the students get out of school and take a break to go work. Yeah. <laughs> Amen, all right? You talk about an unfair fall break, right? You're like, that's not fair. I got out of school. Now I'm going like digging at potatoes. It was, it was a social event. It was something that was much needed for, well, eating, which tends to be a pretty popular activity in human nature, right? And so in Scotland, they have what's called the toddy holidays, the potato holiday, where people get out of school and go help do this work. Now, this is, this is very similar to what's going on in Palestine when the landowner who owns the vineyard, when it's grape picking time, it is go time because pretty soon the rains will come and the rains will destroy the crops of grapes. So the landowner knows as soon as those grapes are ripe, it is time and it is all hands on deck and I need as many workers as I can get. And so he goes to the marketplace and all day long, man, he's just bringing, back, bringing more guys in. Are you standing around not doing anything? You need some work? All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's, let's pick these grapes, and we've got work to do. And this is God in his field in the world. Now, we have this story of a landowner who goes out to hire people into his service. So a, a quick little sidestep. So for some of you who have heard this parable, this parable is not about salvation. This is not about earning rewards. Now, in Scripture, there are places where God talks about rewards for those who serve in the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 3 and John 4, Jesus, Jesus talks about these things. But this parable, this is not about salvation. It's not about rewards. What this parable is about, this parable is about the why behind why you serve the kingdom, the reason that you serve the king of kings, the motivation that you have in your own heart today to serve Jesus to love Jesus with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength to be his hands and feet. It's the why you serve Jesus. And then in the parable, the landowner, God, he agrees to pay two groups of workers. Now, the first group of workers, I don't know if you noticed this difference in, uh, the, inside the parable as we read it, but at the beginning when he hired those first guys at 6 a.m., there's 
two groups of workers, and the first group are those who ask for a contract. It's the contract workers. And they start early in the day, and they work all day long through the hot sun. So at the end of the day, when they cry foul because of equal pay for unequal work, there's a part of you and I that go, yeah, Jesus, what's up with that? Equal pay for unequal work? Are you kidding me? And we have to be very careful that the spirit of the elder brother, if you remember the story of the lost son, doesn't rise up in us. If you remember the parable of the lost son or the lost sons, the one son takes the family inheritance and wealth and runs off and blows it all. And so then you have the elder brother who's been faithful and staying home and serving. And then he's thinking, you bring home this sinful, worthless brother of mine who's squandered the family inheritance and you kill the fattened calf and throw a big party for him? Are you kidding me? That's not fair. That's not fair. It's the same spirit that was in Jonah. If you remember the prophet Jonah, we had a sermon series over that a few months back. Jonah is sent to Nineveh. Does he obey? No. Okay, great story. Eventually he ends up in Nineveh after he's spit out of a giant fish. And the Ninevites hear the word of the Lord. The Ninevites repent. And Jonah's enemies, people who have murdered his own people, They accept the mercy and the forgiveness of God, and there's great celebration and praise in Nineveh. And what does Jonah do as God's prophet? He goes off and he sulks. And he goes up and he's like, I can't believe you did that. Right? That's not fair that you would go after those people. Can't believe it. And we have to be real careful. So, talking to the Christians in the room. And maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for many years. We have to be very careful to not take on the spirit of Jonah and the elder brother and this contract laborer who says, you know what? Look at me. I've been working for Christ all these years. And you find yourself slipping into a temptation of taking your focus off of Christ, who were to joyfully serve, and instead we start putting our focus on other people and thinking, well, I'm not really getting the extra blessing that I feel like I deserve. But what what does God tell these workers at the end of the day? I love it. Verse 13, your Bible uh, might start with the word friend. First off, God calls these contract laborers friend. He says, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a day's wage? What's Jesus' point? Jesus' point is that God keeps his promises, is that God is faithful. Believe that. It's God's grace that has even called these workers into his field and into his kingdom work. There should be joy in their service that they got to work for the king. They got to be with God, yeah, all of their life. They got to be with the Lord all day long and enjoy the service in his field and in his kingdom. But instead, they're not focusing on the grace of God. They're focusing on What they believe is fair. Then there's a second kind of worker, those who simply just jumped in at different intervals throughout the day. Those are the opportunity workers, and they were willing to be paid whatever the landowner decided at the close of the business day. But isn't it interesting that God himself, God is the one who's going out to the marketplace and calling people to himself. There's even... A point in time. It's such amazing grace, right? That God is coming after you. So maybe you need to be reminded today, uh, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, if you're kind of holding Jesus, uh, you know, if you're kind of giving Jesus the, the holy stiff arm right now, I get it. You have some questions. Understand that he's still coming after you, friend. He's still coming after you. He loves you. Those of you in the room who would say, I've given my life to Jesus, guess what? He's still coming after you. You say you belong to Jesus, but do these belong to Jesus? And do these belong to Jesus? Are you you walking into his work, into his kingdom work? Are you you willing to lift some potatoes today for the Lord to get into his work joyfully? Because believe me, he's coming after you, and he needs more and more workers for his harvest in his field. 
It's crazy. There's even a point in time uh, at the end of the day, there's only one hour left of work to be done. And God asks this guy, hey, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? And what's the response of the worker? Because no one has hired us. What do they say? Nobody's hired us. There's a little bit of an assumption there that you and I, the, the workers who, who, if you are a believer of Christ today, that we have, we have a responsibility to go and find more workers for the kingdom. But what is God doing? He's going out to the marketplace himself, and he's finding those who are willing to work. He goes and gets them himself. That's one of the lessons from the first of four questions. There's four questions inside this parable that the landowner asks the question, which is a really important thing. God himself is asking questions in this lesson today. And what about the other questions? Well, we've already visited the second question. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Like we had an agreement. God is saying, I made you a promise, and guess what? I kept it because I'm God. And what, 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 what do we know about God? God always keeps his promises. Friend, if you have forgotten that today, then be reminded. The promises that you grasped and you held on to early in your faith, early in your relationship with Christ, the promises are still the same today as they were years ago. God is always faithful to keep his promises. The third question that God asks, it says, don't I have the right to do with uh, what I want with my own money? That's a great question. This is the one where I've got to be honest. Uh, this, this is uh, maybe, I don't know about for you and your heart and your mind, but this is one where I get humbled quickly. Yeah, at that uh, Fields of Faith event, one of the artists, he was selling these beanies, and on the beanie it says, be humble. And I bought one because I was like, I need that. <laughs> be humble. And here's a humbling moment in the middle of this uh, parable. God is telling the people, I give my grace to whom I see fit. And I give it in a portion that is all my call. Because the truth and the humbling truth is, I am God and you are not, Ryan. If I am going to go after that sinner, who are you to question me? If I rescue that person from an awful, awful scenario, who are you to question me? It's, it's my world. God says, God says, it's, it's my land, it's my field, it's my crop, it's my gifts, it's my grace, and I'm going to distribute my grace as I see fit. I'm going to do it as I please, because why? Because everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. And I don't know about you, but man, I just start feeling, whoo, like, yes, Lord. I mean, that's the God I get to sing to, but we don't stop there, and Jesus doesn't stop there in the parable. The fourth question is, are you envious because I'm kind to others as well? Do you begrudge my generosity, your Bible may say? Or are you, are you getting stingy because I choose to be generous? Because the truth of the matter is, no matter who they are, no matter how far someone is from God, God is still generous. God is a generous God. We serve a generous and kind and loving God. But as you've seen in this parable, some of you have probably already caught on to this. It's a this is where it becomes a really tough lesson because when we're talk I'm talking to, you know, fellow believers in the room, it's not really a fun topic to talk, to talk about Christians being jealous of other Christians. Can I just go ahead and say that? That's not really a fun topic. But are you and I being envious and jealous of other people again because we're not flying right side up. We're flying upside down. And instead of keeping our focus on God, now we're putting our focus on, well, why does she have that and I don't? What? How, how come he and not, not me? When we start thinking of fairness instead of God's grace. Now, when Jesus was speaking this parable, what did he have? A whole bunch of Jews surrounding him. And his cautionary tale for them, the lesson for them is like, listen, Many of you Jews, you've, you, right, you've, got, you've got the Torah, you've got the prophets and the law, you have so much history. And yes, that is so great. But now the kingdom is among us. Now I'm calling you to discipleship. And there's, there's a new thing called Christianity. I'm going to build a church. And it's not just going to include Jews. I'm also going to bring in some sheep 
who weren't originally in the pen. I'm going to bring in some Gentile Christians as well. So don't you Jews who were here at 6 in the morning start getting really frustrated with the Gentiles who get called in at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. At the same time, here we are in 2020. You may have known Jesus for a really long time. And the caution to you and I is, how, how dare we question God when a new believer comes in and they get excited and they're ready to do more work than you are. They're ready to invite more people to Christ than you are inviting to Christ. They're ready and they're willing to go and be the hands and feet to places that you and I may, might not be called to go. Are we to be jealous of them and envious of them? No. Every single time that anybody does anything for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of Jesus, you know what our right response is to do? It's the name of our church. <laughs> rejoice! When somebody comes to Christ, rejoice! When somebody moves to Alaska to become missionaries from this church, yeah? What do we do? We go, I can't believe that the good one. No, we don't do that. We say, yes, Lord. And what do we do? We do the same thing that those people do. We say, God, here's my yes. I'm putting it on the table. Now you just tell me where to go and what to do with it. I'm not going to be jealous and envious of another believer. I'm not going to look at another sheep and go, nah. <laughs> right? I mean, that's kind of what we do, right? That's not fair. God is generous to all. It's a, it's a lesson in jealousy. Now, ugh, such a fun lesson. But here's the thing. I'm going to use a fable. Now, the rules of a fable are as follows. Animals can talk. Okay? All right. So, there was an eagle one day who saw another eagle soaring high and mighty in the air and thought, Ugh, can't stand that guy. So he goes to the hunter. He goes, hey, hunter, you see that eagle? Yeah. Can you shoot him down? I need you to kill that eagle. You know, thinking he's so much better. Such a great eagle, flying high and doing all that cool stuff up there. I need you to kill him. And the hunter goes, well, I would, uh, but my arrows, they can't reach that high. I need more feathers. So the eagle says, okay, here you go. Hunter makes a new arrow. Well, not high enough. Not high enough. I'm going to need some more feathers. So the eagle goes, Whoo, here you go. So the hunter says, thank you. And kills that eagle. And that's what jealousy does in the heart of a Christian. Is when a Christian looks up at another Christian who has gone on to do something, anything, of any worth or value in the kingdom, and you start to compare yourself to them, whew, friends, that is a trap. It's, it's a trap from Satan. Envy is a killer. Jealousy is a killer. Focusing on anything other than the king and the kingdom, it's a killer. Instead, the right response of when an eagle sees another eagle flying up high, you go, man, that's awesome. Way to go. Keep going. Right? We're to rejoice with them. Instead of going, you know what? I don't think they really deserve all that. All of a sudden, you become the blessing police, right? You start inspecting. You're the inspector of everybody's blessings, and you're like, do you really deserve that? Did you really earn that? I mean, hold up, God. Hold up. I mean, I want you to bless everybody, right? God, whoa, hold up. I'm not that mean. I mean, I want you to bless everybody. If you scoop a little extra blessing on top of mine, I sure would have think, I think that's great. Or can we just look at another believer and say, praise God for that. <laughs> praise God for that. Praise God that he's blessed you in that way. Praise God for the talents that he's given you. Praise God for the time that you're able to invest in the kingdom when others who are younger than you might not be able to invest in the kingdom that way. Praise God for the treasures that God has given you so that you can pour into and fuel the vision and the mission of the local church, unlike others who don't have the finances that you do. Praise God for that and that and that and that, instead of comparing ourselves to one another, which is such a dangerous trap. Yes, 
God has been gracious to you. And so the Christian works, you and I work, for the joy of serving God and serving man. That's why at the end, Jesus says, the first will be last and the last will be first. There are many people in this world who have earned great rewards that will have a very low place in the eternal kingdom because rewards were their sole fo focus here on earth. All they want from God is a blessing. So they just, they just bless me, God, just bless me, God. And they're not worried about the kingdom to come. But then there are many other people that the world count as poor will be great in the kingdom because they never thought in terms of reward, but they worked for the thrill, <laughs> for the thrill and the joy of serving Christ. That's the paradox of the Christian life, that those who aim at a reward will lose it, but whoever forgets the reward will find it. The Christian is the one who focuses on the king and the kingdom. That's what Jesus is talking about in this parable. He's reminding us of the kingdom of God and what it looks like. And the kingdom is anywhere that God rules or reigns. God's kingdom is right here, right now. Do you believe that? God's kingdom is here. And this kingdom is the gospel. This is the gospel that Jesus preached. That's why he said over and over and over again, the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is at hand. So repent. This is the, this is the gospel Jesus preached. But is this the gospel we're preaching that we're using to advance the kingdom? The kingdom is here, and yet, at the same time, it's not yet fully realized in all the fullness that it will one day be proclaimed and understood. One day, every eye will see, every mind will perceive it, every heart will understand and will yearn to be a part of that kingdom, and every knee will bow before the throne of the Lamb who was slain for our sins. One day, every tongue will not be able to hold back the praises that will gush forth from our mouths in bold declaration that there is one God, there is one Lord, there is one Savior, there's one King, and his name is Jesus. One day, that's going to happen, and praise God for that, but not yet. And do you know why? I mean, we have the Great Commission, right? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. We also have this great goal in Matthew in the same gospel book where Jesus says something about this gospel of the kingdom. In Matthew 24, 14, he says, this gospel, this good news about the kingdom, there's a promise. It will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And guess what? And then the end will come. Amen. Looking forward to that. But not until the gospel of the kingdom is preached to all nations. So how are you and I being a part of that? You know how you're never going to be a part of that? By sitting back and just focusing on and thinking about what is fair and not fair to you. And how you feel like you deserve more. And how dare they have all that and I don't. That's going to keep you from being active. But instead, if you focus today, if you put on your gospel goggles of grace, and you think of the grace of God that has been poured out on you, that all that you have is God's grace to you. That your salvation today is God's grace to you. That the infinite love of God is a grace that's poured out on you because of your and my infinite amount of sins that causes an infinite cost that cannot be paid, God in his grace shows infinite love by paying that infinite price, by sending his son to die on the cross. Friends, I think you've probably already thought this, but if you want fairness from God, you can have it. But I don't think you want it. Because the only thing that we deserve, the only thing that is fair for us to earn is the wrath of God. That's what we deserve. But God in his great grace took that infinite amount of wrath. And what did he do? He poured it onto his only son so that you and I could receive an infinite gift worth an infinite measure for all of eternity. And how dare we, believers, 
in the room, how dare we sit back and not invite other people into that party? I mean, God's sending out invitations left and right. Are you willing to send out invitations to people that you might not have called if it were up to you? Because, hey, before we're done, you know that marketplace that the landowner went to? Who was he calling to himself to work? Not the employed, not the educated, not the rich and wealthy. He was calling the men who were standing in the marketplace desperately needing work to provide for their family that day. And they're saying, yes and amen. I want to be a part of that kingdom. Invite me in. I will work for you with all the joy that's in my heart. You, I've only got an hour left. Let's go. I've got five years left here on earth. I've got 20 years left here on earth. You don't know how long you have here left on earth. Yes, Lord, I surrender. I want to be in your kingdom. I want to work for the king, and I want to pour out that same grace to other people, the same grace that you've shown me. I want to show it to others so that they too can be in the kingdom of God. If you're a believer today and you say, hey, Ryan, like I need you to pray for me because, man, jealousy and envy, it rises up in my heart and I start comparing myself to other people, then I want to pray for you today. Because the truth is, friends, I, I don't mean to like call you out on it, okay? But I'm going to anyway, all right? You can't help in your flesh to find something to be jealous about other people. But the jealousy that you struggle with might not be the same thing that I struggle with. We can all become envious of others. So maybe today you just need to surrender that and lift that up to Jesus and say, Jesus, help me to not focus on what's fair. Help me to focus on your grace today. And if you're in the room today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, then understand this. There was a great unfairness that happened against God on your behalf so that you wouldn't have to experience the wrath of God, so that you could be adopted as a son and a daughter into his kingdom. And so maybe today is the day for you to say yes to Jesus, to say yes to the kingdom of God, to say yes to being a worker in the vineyard for the joy of serving the God who loves you and who made you and formed you and has a purpose for you today. That's our hope and our prayer today at Rejoice. If you would, bow your heads with me and let's pray.